So, welcome to the presentation for today. We're going to be taking a different approach. We're going to be trying to mix fundamentals with technicals, and we're going to be discussing practically fundamental issues which may be affecting a pair and at the same time see the charts, see how the market may have reacted to a number of news which or financial data which came out. It's going to be an interesting presentation. My name is Peter Yosef, Senior Market Analyst at RNFX. In front of your screens, you have the US dollar index. It's the four chart. And with no time to waste, we highlight the sideways motion of the US dollar index between the 105.40 resistance line and the 103.75 support line. I would note that I think it's going to be an interesting week for USD traders in the sense that high impact financial releases and in general events are about to increase. And that could create, I would say, some initiative on behalf of the US dollar and FX market, which could more or less increase also volatility. Note how the US dollar was clearly in the sideways motion in the chart in front of you between the 105.40 and 103.75. And that's been happening practically since the, I would say, 20th of February, but it became more clear practically since the breaking of the upward trend line, which was on the 27th of uh, February last Monday, one week ago. And note how sideways the motion was throughout the week. Very low volatility. Note how the Bolger bands have flattened out in contrast, for example, with the 50 and the 100 moving averages. Today, we are noting for USD traders, practically, there's only one release which could generate substantial interest, and that would be the factory orders growth rate. It's for January. It's expected to drop from minus, sorry, from 1.8% month to month to minus 1.8% month to month. Such a decline could more or less imply that we have a weakening of economic activity in the manufacturing sector of the U.S. Definitely not a good sign and could weaken the USD. Tomorrow, Tuesday, the main event is expected to be definitely the testimony of Fed Chairman Powell before the Senate. Now, the Fed's intentions have been an issue which has been puzzling uh, USD traders over the past weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the US dollar getting some support should Fed Chairman Powell actually maintain quite a hawkish tone. And the main reason I'm saying this is because given that we have a rather tight US employment market, given that we have inflationary pressures which tend to remain persistently high, stubbornly even high, it was characteristic how the core PC price index for February, sorry, for January, highlighted this aspect of inflationary pressures. At the same time, we tend to note also rather robust demand side of the US economy, despite the US consumer confidence dropping for the current for February. We still see that the demand side of the US economy tends to remain rather solid. I would be noting here that the Fed may be running out of options and may have to drive the US economy into a hard landing instead of the wish so far 
soft landing, which would imply that a recession should occur, would even be a shallow one. The Fed may be running out of options and may have to actually dip the US economy into a deeper recession in order to curb inflationary pressures by practically reducing the demand side. Otherwise, it risks the possibility of inflationary pressures becoming entrenched in the US economy if they haven't already. And I would also note that we may see a period of low growth with high inflationary pressures tormenting the US economy. It's a big issue. So getting back now to Fed Chairman Powell's testimony before the Senate, we may see him actually sounding hawkish. I wouldn't be surprised to see U.S. senators, especially from the Democratic Party, being somewhat of a critic and actually grill the Fed chairman with questions, in which case we may see him even getting a little bit out of script, providing some surprises for the market, increasing volatility for the U.S. dollar index and general USD pairs, major pairs. Once again, it's going to be a testimony which is going to be closely watched by market participants and analysts alike. So keep an eye out. I would also be noting on Wednesday we have the ADP National Employment Figure. It's expected to rise from 106K to 195K. It's a bit optimistic. The number of traders which tend to link the release of Wednesday with the NFP figure of Friday, which we tend to avoid that. But nevertheless, as an employment market indicator, the ADP cannot just be ignored. It will get some attention and it should be noted. Should the figure actually rise, could provide some support, as that would imply that the U.S. economy was able to create a higher number of new jobs, and thus tend to imply that it may be even tighter. Other than that, we have Fed Chairman Powell testifying again, this time before the House of Representatives. So he will be looking at the second testimony, different set of questions from U.S. lawmakers, should also be kept an eye out. On Thursday, we get the initial jobless claims figure. Now, there is a paradox here in the sense that the initial jobless claims figure has been expected to rise for over five weeks. Let's have a look at that. Definitely for the past One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, even more. Yeah, nine weeks. It has missed its target to rise for the past nine weeks. It's always set higher and it always lands lower. Actually, there was one exception, and that was on the 9th of February, four weeks ago. Other than that, we have this tendency of estimations being over the actual released figure. And this week is no exception, or may be an exception, sorry, we have the actual figure yet. But the estimation is for the figure to rise from 190 to 195k. Should the initial jobless claims figure actually drop, that could imply once again that the US employment market may be tighter than what's expected. On the flip side, should it surpass the expectation of 195k, could imply that there is a wider slack in the U.S. employment market than expected and could weaken the U.S.D. 
And the highlight of the week is expected to be the U.S. employment report for February on Friday, just before the American session starts. The income payroll figure is expected to drop from 517k to 200. It's a wide, wide drop. The unemployment rate is expected to remain unchanged at 3.4%, which is actually pretty low. And I would be noting also that the average earnings growth rate on a year-on-year level is expected to accelerate from 4.4% to 4.7%. Definitely a possible drop of the NFP figure could be disappointing for USD traders and could weaken the US dollar. On the other hand, we have to note here that for the NFP dripper, oh, sorry, for the NFP figure to drop from 517k to 200k, it's a very wide drop, and the figure as such may not drop as expected. It may drop, yet it may land at a position higher than the expectations of 200k. In which case, we may see the market repositioning itself and actually supporting the US dollar. And don't forget that the acceleration of the average hourly earnings on a year-on-year basis, which is expected, should that occur, that would imply that practically employment income is going to continue to feed inflationary pressures in the US economy, which may turn the Fed even more hawkish. So practically, that's another bullish indication. As for the unemployment rate being stable at 3.4%, come on, people, when was the U.S. unemployment rate at 3.4? I'm looking it up right now, and I'm telling you, I cannot find it. Maybe before COVID, yes. But even then, the lowest I'm getting here is at 3.5 for the past three or four years. So remaining at 3.4% intends to imply that exactly the U.S. employment market remains pretty tight. So even should the NFP figure drop, yet should the unemployment rate remain unchanged at 3.4, that could imply that the U.S. employment market, despite the possible drop of the NFP figure, remains r- very tight. And that would be another green light for the Fed to actually remain hawkish. So on the one hand, we have the drop of the NFP figure, which could be disappointing for USD traders and could weaken the US dollar. On the flip side, we have to recognize that should the unemployment rate remain at 3.4%, the average earnings accelerate, that could imply that the Fed's going to remain hawkish. So it's going to be interesting to see how the actual release is going to be affecting the US dollar. Also, mind you that the release as such could have ripple effects also on gold as well as US stock markets. Now back to the technical analysis part of the presentation. We tend to maintain our bias for the sideways motion of the US dollar index to continue for the time being between the 105.40 and the 103.75. Boys, but research tended to suggest that the S1 could be raised up until here and the resistance line, the R1, could be lowered up until here. It's not much of a difference, and I would like to allow it for more breathing space here. The RSI indicator dropped below the reading of 50, yet remained close by. It's actually right now at 46. So I wouldn't say that it points towards a bearish outlook, no. On the contrary, I would say that there's still a rather 
indecisive market about where to actually push the US dollar. I would be noting that should the bulls take over, for bullish outlook, I would require clearly a breaking of the 10540 resistance line. Now, should that be broken, then the next possible target for the bulls would be the 106.80, in our opinion. And let's have a look at that. You can see how beautifully the 106.80 provided resistance here. And here there was a false break, okay, but overall the level tended to hold on as it was tested also here and here and here. So there were multiple tests on that level. I'm keeping that. On the flip side, the bear stick over. We expect the price action to drop break the 103.75 which provides support beautifully here and resistance here so it was tested on both sides also provided support here and should the s1375 be broken then we may see the index starting to aim for the 102.45 which provided support here aimed for here resistance here tested here so it's a pretty valid level as well. Now, I know we extended our analysis on the US dollar, both on a fundamental as well as on a technical level substantially, and there's a good reason why. We expect that over this week, the US dollar may regain some of the initiative and be the main market mover. So should we see, say, for example, the US dollar weakening, we may see at the same time Euro USD and GBP USD being on the rise. The gravity and the frequency of high impact financial releases and economic events stemming from the US is increasing. This week. At the same time, note that the earnings season, okay, it's Still on, but actually the number of high impact financial releases from high profile companies is expected to be reduced. And the actual number of earnings reports throughout this week is expected to be reduced if compared to the past two or three weeks. So we may see more or less the market refocusing on the USD. Let's move now to EURUSD. EURUSD, which has some slight bullish tendencies, but to tell you the truth, I would feel far more comfortable seeing the pair actually breaking the 1.0655 resistance line, a level which was tested during today's European session and it hit the ceiling. The level held its ground and pushed the pair for the time being for now lower. I would expect that should the bullish tendencies be realized, we may see the price action of EURUSD breaking the 1.0655 and start aiming for the 1.079. We have a number of releases this week which could provide more or less some volatility for Europeans on a more monetary level before we get into Eurozone's financial releases. I would be noting that we have rather hawkish ECB. And given the acceleration of Eurozone's preliminary HSEP rate for February, that may exactly sharpen its hawkishness even further. Now for the current week, I would note that we have Germany's factory orders tomorrow. They're expected to drop into the negatives. Okay, that's a negative for the euro, definitely. On the other hand, though, I would be noting that the industrial production growth rate is expected to accelerate, actually get out of the negatives and accelerate into the positives, reaching 1.5% month on month. So the spearhead of 
German's economy, the largest economy in the Eurozone, is expected to produce more for the month? And should that be the case, actually for January, not for the month? And should that be the case, we may see the euro getting some support. I would be highlighting definitely also the revised GDP rate for quarter four of the Eurozone. And on the monetary front, please note that we have a number of speakers. We have uh, definitely ECB Nagard, which will be speaking on Wednesday. And at the same time, ECB's Panetta will also be speaking. While we have Panetta, Macol, and Lagarde in three different occasions speaking on Friday as well. Please note that we had already ECB Chief Strategist Lane which spoke during today's European session. Now, there wasn't much which could be mentioned. I would be noting that we had a slight reversal of Lane's talks. Lane had argued in the past week that the ECB is winning the war on inflation. That comes into direct contrast with today's comments, where practically ECB's chief strategist, Philip Lane, had stated that the idea of more and substantial rate hikes after the March meeting seems to be fitting with inflation rates remaining stubbornly high. So we have here a hawkish turn on behalf of Lane, which could be providing some support for the euro. Once again, sideways motion seems to be maintained. It was characteristic how the RSI indicator, despite being on the rise, corrected lower near the reading of 50, it's still just above it, yet it's narrative, and that was indicative that the bulls are not so certain quite yet. I would maintain my bias for sideways motion between the 1.0655 and the 1.05, yet the voice of research once again suggested that the S1 could be a little bit higher, reaching this show here. I wouldn't argue with that. I would agree. Should the bus be over, we expect the 1.0655 resistance line to be clearly broken, and in which case we may see the pair aiming if not reaching the 1.079. On the flip side, should the best take over, we would require a bearish outlook, a wide, wide drop, breaking below the 1.05, which provides support clearly here, and the pair to start aiming for the 1.0310. I know it. It's pretty wide and pretty far-fetched, but I would expect nothing less for a clear bearish outlook. Let's have a look at the table. Once again, a sideways motion seems to be prevailing. It's interesting how cable has been confined between the 1.2115 and the 1.1925. I would be noting that we we'll already discussed the USD side. On the monitor front, the pound is a little bit disappointed by the comments made by BOE Governor Andrew Bailey last week, where practically BOE's chief actually, I wouldn't say highlighted, but suggested that the bank may be nearing its terminal rate, and that further rate hikes may be avoided. And that tended to imply some dovishness. Now, that dovishness, of course, came into direct contrast with Catherine Mann, which is also a BOE board member and an MPC member, Monetary Policy Committee member, where she was a little bit more to the hawkish side. So there is a balance of power, a struggle within BOE on 
which direction the bank should have over the coming months. And I would say even over the coming meeting. It's going to be interesting to see any further comments by BOE policymakers this week ahead of the bank's meeting. Now, as for financial releases, oh, before I mention any financial releases, let me mention that we have BOE Deputy Governor Woods, which will be speaking on Wednesday in the European session and could create some comments here. So that was on Tuesday. And I would be noting also for tomorrow that we may having the Halifax house prices for February. The data such bears a slight degree of uncertainty. It could be postponed. But should it be released tomorrow, it could create some volatility for pound pairs. So I would be keeping my eye out for a possible release in the early European session. The main event, though, for the pound, I think it's on Friday. We are getting the UK's GDP rate on a month-to-month -month basis, that's for January, as well as the manufacturing output growth rate. Should there be an acceleration as expected, that would be positive news. That would practically interrupt, I wouldn't say the recession, but definitely the negative outlook, this gloomy, heavy outlook that the UK economy currently has. So it's a much seeked, seeked for acceleration of the GDP rate. And definitely pound traders will be having a close eye over the release. Okay, let's move now to use the JPY. Once again, we have a sideways motion here. Tighter definitely than the S1 and the R1 are describing. And that could be pushing the boundaries a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Allow me for, because this comment has been made by my side. Also for the US dollar, Euro USD and cable. And we're seeing it being repeated also in USDJPY. I recognize that we had lower volatility than expected over the past week. I would like that to be repeated also today at the opening of the new week before actually narrowing the margins of the sideways motions. So I'm keeping the current levels. The RSI indicator remains close to the reading of 50. It's just below it, but actually it's right now at 49. The note how the Bollinger Bands have narrowed. It's an also an indication of low volatility for use to JPY, which could allow practically for the sideways motion to continue between the S1 and the R1. Other than that, it's a big, big week for JPY traders. We are having a number of financial releases. And I would be noting definitely, allow me, the revised GDP rate of Japan, that would be for quarter four. That's on Thursday. And it's interesting that on a year-on-year -year level, it's expected to accelerate slightly from 0.6% to 0.8. Could be a positive for the JPY, as that would imply that the Japanese economy grew at a faster pace than expected for quarter four, or if you prefer, than initially measured. But before that, <clears throat> sorry, during Wednesday's Asian session, we also know the release of the current account balance. It's for the month of January. And it's expected to drop into the negatives, reaching 0 0.8 trillion yen. More or less a little bit disappointing. That would imply that the Japanese economy suffered from its interaction with the international payment system over the month of January. 
And I would also be noting on Friday the release of the household spending growth rate. On a month-on-month -month rate, the month-on-month -month level, the rate is expected to accelerate and get out of the negatives. It's expected to rise from minus 2.1% month-on-month to plus 1.4. Definitely a positive that the demand side of the Japanese economy remains solid. I would be highlighting, though, the main event of the week for JPY to be BOJ's interest rate decision. Now, the bank is widely expected to remain on hold at minus 0.10%, and JPY or S imply probability of around 95%, sorry, 92% for such a scenario to materialize. So it's widely expected that the bank will remain on hold, keeping its negative interest rate. The big question here arises on two fronts. A, you have to note that it's going to be Mr. Kuroda's last meeting. He will be stepping down afterwards as UJ governor. And Mr. Weda is to be leading the bank into its next meeting in April. So... The question here arises not on whether the bank will be hiking rates or not. The question arises, A, will the bank be tweaking its ultra loose monetary policy? Say, for example, by widening the bands of its yield curve control or not. Should that be the case, which the bank may be inclined to do so, in order to take the markets by surprise, that would be a substantial bullish surprise for JPY. On the flip side, though, given that it's also the last meeting of Mr. Kuroda, he may prefer to keep his ultra-loose monetary policy intact, and that could weigh on JPY somewhat. Now, as for... The technical level, we have mentioned that we maintain our sideways bias. And I would be noting that should the bears start taking over, say, for example, the USD weakens or the JPY strengthens, we may see the pair dropping, breaking the 135 support line and start aiming for the 132.85 support level right here. That would be a drop like this. On the other hand, should the bulls regain control after the stabilization, we may see the price action. By the way, let me shift this a little bit to the right, like this. Should the bulls regain control, I would expect the price action to rise, break the 137.80 resistance line, and start aiming for the 139.90. Once again, for the time being, sideways bias is being maintained. Moving now to USDCHF. USDCHF, which had an interesting movement during today's European session, early European session, we had the release of Switzerland's CPI rates. And in this case, we had an acceleration. The rate as such was expected to slow down. It didn't. It actually accelerated, reaching 3.4%. That was year on year. And then to provide some support for the CHF. Let's have a look at that. Yeah. And it's interesting how it even accelerated on a month to month basis. It was indicative of how strong inflationary pressures are are present in the Swiss economy. Let's have a look at the time of the release, the reaction of USDCHF. It was about two hours ago, it is three hours, sorry. And we had a wide, wide drop of around 20 peeps or so. 21 in the moment of the release in the first in the following two minutes there was some struggling here at the end it dropped even lower 
before actually starting to bounce and correcting higher. And now it's back at the levels it was before the release. Even a little bit higher. It was a nice bullish, sorry, bearish surprise for USDC, Jeff. Actually, bullish one for the Swiss currency. So the question arises, what about direction? Well, we seem to have a strong bearish movement here. Okay, maybe not that strong, but still there is a bearish movement present. And I would also note that we have a downward motion of the RSI indicator, which has dropped below the reading of 50. And it's currently at 39 which seems to be more or less another indication for the bears. I would be keeping a bearish outlook as long as the price action remains below the downward trend line. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the price starting to aim, if not even breach the S1 75. Well, some of you guys have argued that the S1 could be higher, definitely S1 could be R1 as well. But our main focus is at the S1. Let me correct this a little bit. And that would be placed on 0 0.9310. Let me make it a little bit more obvious. A bearish outlook, a clear bearish outlook, we would require lower trend than this one. So practically, we would require for the pair to drop and break the 0 0.9310. By the way, let's also correct the R1 which is now being placed at 0 0.9435. And I would also be correcting the S2. Also on a micro level, just a bit higher, like here. This true here. Ninety one sixty keeps up. Also on a monster level, I would be highlighting the speech of SMB Chief Jordan, Thomas Jordan. And that's going to be practically on Tuesday tomorrow in the late American session. Now should the SMP chairman actually sound hawkish enough, which given also the acceleration of the CPI rates, could provide the grounds for such a tone. We may see the CHF strengthening even further. So I think it's going to be an interesting element because earlier on we're getting the speech of Fed Chairman Powell, which could be affecting the US. CHF pair on the flip side in that direction. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be interesting to watch how this whole thing plays out with Powell's comments on the one hand and Jordan's comments later on. Let's have a look at the Aussie. Aussie traders, which definitely we have some, to, some corrections to make here. We have a very tight range bound motion. Let me correct that. And that would be the 0 0.6785. The R1 goes higher, far higher. 
6840. Sorry, that will be 6640. My man, my mistake. Let's go back a little bit. Given the lower, I would be noting the, sorry, the S2 at 0 0.6580, 85. And the S3 quite low. Yeah, that's true. Sixty-four. There's a wide difference, I know it, but we could also place it here. This peak here. Sixty-four, sixty. And that's locked in. Readjusting the chart. Now, as I'm tracking the chart, let's talk a little bit about fundamentals. Now, we have definitely moves which are coming out of China, which could be affecting the Aussie as well. National Congress of Chinese is about to announce practically new measures which may be supporting the Chinese economy. So that's one interesting element to watch out for. The second element, or if you prefer, in my opinion, that's also the primary element of the week, would be RBA's interest rate decision. The bank is expected widely to hike rates by 25 basis points. Actually, AUPOS implied probability of around 83% for such a scenario to materialize. So it's substantial. And the second element I would be noting here would be that should the bank actually hike rates as expected, that could provide some support for the Aussie. But I think that given that the market may have already priced in, largely priced in the scenario, we may see the attention of the market also shifting towards Governor Lowe's accompanying statement. Should the governor maintain a confident hawkish tone that no rate hikes are to come given also the political pressure that was exercised by him by australian lawmakers and the criticism we may see the aussie getting some support on the flip side should governor low in his statement sound hesitant and uncertain implying that the political criticism which took place may have influenced the bank's judgment and call, or even should the slowdown of the GDP rate of the Australian economy actually exercise some pressure on RBA's hawkish comments or hawkish stance, that could turn practically the hike the 25 basis points hike of RBA into a dovish hike, in which case we may see the Aussie weaken. So should the bulls take over during tomorrow's Asian session, I wouldn't be surprised to see the price action breaking, or if you prefer, I would be required to break above the 0 0.6785 for a bullish outlook. The pair has to break its upper boundary in order for the bulls to dominate. And in which case we may see the bulls leading the way up to the 6880, 0 0.6880 resistance level, a level which used to be a support line primarily, but has provided those resistance here. So it's a valid one. On the flip side, 
should RBA's interest rate decision disappoint us traders and the bears take over? We may see price action dropping, breaking the 6640 and start aiming for the 6585. Last but not least, let's have a look at use the cat. It's a quick one. Definitely, once again, sideways motion is narrower than expected, and we have to readjust the levels once again. But once again, allow me that after today's opening, American opening in the US. Main event for the week for CAT traders is expected to be BOC's interest rate decision. The bank is due out to release its interest rate decision tomorrow on Wednesday in the American session. It's expected to remain on hold. The big question, once again, I think falls on the company statement. Should the company statement imply in any way that the bank may have reached its terminal rate and there are no more rate hikes to come, I think we may see that having a bearish effect on the Canadian dollar. So that would cause the USD cat to rise. Uh, we would also note that on Friday, we are getting the release of Canada's employment data. There for February, that at the same time as the US employment report for the same month is throughout. So it will be in direct contrast to it. Definitely a correction lower for the employment change figure is expected and it's going to be most probably a wide one. While the employment rate is expected to tick up, should both indicators actually be realized? Say, for example, we see uh, the employment change figure dropping, reaching maybe even, I don't know, as low as 10K. 15k that could create substantial bearish tendencies for the Canadian dollar. A possible tick up for the unemployment rate could practically enhance this. So be on the lookout at the time of the release. We may see some increased volatility if we use the cat. So that should be about it from all of us here at Iron Effects. Best wishes for solid trading. In our previous video, we talked about various indicators regarding inflation. In this video, we will look at two indicators related to employment. The first one is the unemployment rate, which is probably the most widely known labor market indicator. It measures the number of unemployed people as a percentage of the labor force. It is like an indicator, which means that it generally rises or falls when economic conditions change. When the economy is in bad shape and jobs are scarce, the unemployment rate can be expected to rise. When the economy grows at a healthy rate and there are lots of job vacancies, it can be expected to fall. The second indicator is the non-farm payrolls figure, NFP for short. This is a key indicator used primarily for the US employment market, although it is also used for other countries as well. It measures the change in the number of people employed during the surveys month excluding the farming industry. Basically, the indicator measures the US employment market's ability to create jobs, which also has an effect on consumer spending. It is released on the first Friday of every month and is very closely watched by investors, as well as the Fed and other US policymakers. If the indicator rises more than market expectation, 
the US dollar may strengthen and vice versa. Note that the change in this indicator can be very volatile and could create a wider market distortion as the ripple effects may also be felt in the US stock markets. Thank you for watching. Okay, let us begin. So yeah, welcome to another webinar series brought to you by INFX. So today we'll be going through the Fibonacci series, three out of four on expansions. So I got to read the disclaimer first, so do bear with me. So the information in this webinar should not be considered investments advice or an investment recommendation, but instead educational material only. So this material is just the personal opinion of the author, which is myself, and the client investment objectives and risk tolerance have not been considered. So INFX is not responsible for any loss arising from any information contained. Redistribution of the material is strictly prohibited. Hey, hi there, Andrew. Andrew Robinson. Okay, I'll just about to start the webinar on Fibonacci series, part three of four on expansions. Okay, just a very, very quick introduction to myself. My name is Chen Yongting and I'm actually from Evers Fortune Group. So we are actually the finalists for the best Forex research for 2019, 2020 and 2021. We are also the finalists for the best equity research for 2020 and 2021. So right now, we actually have a very, very special collaboration with INFX where we are bringing you guys the good stuff. Okay, before we begin, so I'll just show you guys. So if you want to find out more of, of these free webinars like this in the future, you can go under INFX.com under INFX School under webinars so you can click on it and then i'll send a link to the chat also so that's where you can sign up for future webinars like this okay where's the where's it, webinars okay where's that link okay, i think i have an ad blocker in place okay it's right here at the bottom okay i just saw it disappeared again all right here Okay, so yeah, right there, Fibonacci series, three out of four expansions. Next, we actually have Jindal and Sarah, which is tomorrow. Okay, there's also the INFX YouTube channel. You can actually watch replays on the past live that we have actually went through. So I'll send a link to the YouTube channel. You guys can check it out there. And last but not least, if you want to contact me, outside of this webinar, you can actually contact me through this link right here. I said send a link to the chat already. It's a link tree, link tree link about myself. It's basically a portfolio of myself, LinkedIn profile, and everything else about me. So feel free to check it out. Follow me there if you're interested. Ask me any questions that you want outside of this webinar. All right, let us begin. Okay, so a few topics to cover today. Few agendas, a recap on Fibonacci retracement essentials, ideal market structure, significant swings, and following the market trend. We also have the different Fib retracement levels and what are Fibonacci expansions, which is the main highlights of this webinar, and going through confluence levels. So let us begin. So Fibonacci retracement checklist, just a, just a very, very quick look at this. The market structure, is it clear or not? Look for big zigzags. So actually you notice that 
the market is moving very, very closely along the Fibonacci trend line. So you can actually see this nice little blue line right there going through the charts. Let me clear this out. So it's actually a very, very clear structure, very, very clear downtrend, bearish market. So identify the recent trend prices going up or down. In this scenario, it's going down. So you connect the two extreme points, drawing from the top of the swing high, which is the starting point to the bottom of the swing low. So this is how you draw a Fibonacci retracement. Okay, looking at this, insignificant swings. Recap, you are not going to care about all these tiny, tiny movements on the chart. Take a look. So look at this GIF, it's actually drawing out all the insignificant swings or using the orange highlighter. It's too insignificant, so you cannot just draw randomly, you know, from, from this tiny little swing up to this high right there. It's not significant enough. You need to be drawing from this significant swing low right there to this highest point somewhere there. So you draw the, you draw the Fibonacci, it should look something like this. That is a proper significant swing. So if you want, I can actually show an example on the chart. Maybe there's an example. Okay, insignificant swing showed you already. This is too insignificant. All these kind of swings right here. Too, too insignificant to even draw out. Okay, let me see. So this is actually a very, very nice significant swing move right there. Can see? From a swing high, drawing towards a swing low. So it's actually a significant move up with obvious clear market movements. Okay, let me check the previous slide first. Did I miss out anything? Okay. Next, drawing a, sig a significant swing. So here's an another example of significant swings. So I've actually drawn out the picks and trials to point out exactly how clear it should be. So this could be a significant, where is it? Significant swing points. Swing points towards the downside. So you should only be focusing on this. This is just minor swings, which is insignificant. Focus on this. They have circled out, drawing the Fibonacci from the top to the bottom. So it's a very, very clear cut swing right there. Okay, next, let me move on. So next, following the market structure. So the Fibonacci retracement, here's an example of how to not draw a Fib retracement trend line. Your Fibonacci trend line must follow price structure clearly. A hello, a hello there, Olivia. Olivia Ponche. What time frame do you use? Well, time frame doesn't matter. Even on one minute, you have to find something that is significant. Even it, even, it even works on the one hour time frame, four hour time frame, 15 minutes time frame. So I'll show you. Since you're asking that, I'll show you an, an example. Okay. Let's move on to the live chart first. So let's start from the daily, you know, the daily chart. So if you want to draw a Fibonacci trend line from the daily chart, you should be, you should be drawing from this significant swing high right there to the next significant swing low right there. So in order to use the Fibonacci trend line, the tool is right here on the left side of trading view. It should be going right here. Trend line one, two, three, you expand it out. It should be called the FIB retracement tool. So you draw it from the top of the swing high, draw it to the bottom. You notice that it's very, very nice. There's a very, very significant swing. So clearly price is currently trying to reach towards the 50% Fibonacci retracement line. So it's right here. Right here at the fifty percent, we can possibly see. So, for example, right here, euro euro dollar to likely head towards the one point zero nine four four zero level, which is also the Fibonacci 
50% retracements. Okay, let's move on down towards the daily, uh, okay, towards the four hour chart to draw another one. So let's move down to the four hours. So we are looking at a significant swings. So this could be a very, very significant swing. So a swing right here towards a significant swing towards the downside. So you can actually draw a Fibonacci line from the bottom towards the top. You actually notice that price actually retraced back down towards the 61.8% before it continued pushing bullish. So another point you can draw out is since that point swung up, this was a significant swing. And then this was a significant swing high. Same thing, you draw a Fibonacci line from the bottom to the top. It's following very, very closely, very, very nice. And then it swung down. Where did it retrace towards? That's the question. It retraced towards the 61.8% Fibonacci line before pushing higher. All right. So let me find a clear cut one. So there isn't anything clear at the moment that we can actually draw out. Okay, let's move down. Okay, before I move on, this could also be another significant swing. Look at this very, very obvious swing towards the downside. You can start to draw a Fibonacci line. Drawing from the top to the bottom and you notice that price also retraced back up towards the 61.8% Fibonacci line before rejecting back down. So that's a very, very nice way to draw your FIB levels. So next, let me show one last example before we move on towards the one hour chart. It's actually the same on all time frames. So this is a significant high, significant low, can draw price actually. Retrace all the way up towards the 61.8% before rejecting towards the downside. So time frame doesn't matter as long as you know how to draw your chart properly. Everything works well. Hey, hi there, Xion on, on Yen Ni. Hi there. Let's move on towards the one hour chart. Okay. So by the way, those who have just joined, I've actually turned on the chat already. So you can ask me any questions there within the chat. You can talk to me there. Ask me any questions while I'm moving on. If you do not understand, feel free to ask any questions. Do not, do not feel, do not feel that you are slowing down the entire webinar. If you do not understand, that's what we are here to. We are here to learn. So looking at this one hour chart, this could be a significant swing high. This was a swing high. It went all the way back down. A significant swing low, it retraced back towards the 61.8% Fibonacci line. So it went down, tapped, and rejected towards the downside. Okay, next. This was also a very, very obvious. You only you only would be drawing Fibonacci line at the very obvious points. Significant swings. So you draw Fibonacci line from the top towards the bottom. Price actually retraced from the bottom towards the 61.8% Fibonacci line before, you know, it kind of short sellers try to take over, but the buyers took hold. So likely we can see Euro dollar continue moving to the upside. Okay, so just move on 30 minutes. I'll just continue making it faster and faster. So this is actually quite a significant swing also. Significant swing, it actually swung up, hit back down, and retraced back up. So you can draw a Fibonacci line from the bottom towards the top. It likely retraced towards the 23.6% Fibonacci line. You can see right there. Very, very clear cut. Price very, very nicely moving. Hit back down, retrace, and shot right up. Hey, hi there, Rajesh Rama. And hi there, Tevin Campbell. Okay, Juha. Uh, you actually asked, want to see Brent's oil retracement. Well, let's go towards that. So if you are watching on your computer, feel free to open TradingView. Let's practice this together. Hopefully we can improve our trading together. 
پیره میتونن کود آی رایت کود آی گرند کود آی Okay, looking at this, at this, okay, maybe I should move towards the one hour chart. It's a very, very obvious significant swing high right there that we are looking at before price swung all the way down. So we can actually draw a Fibonacci line from the top to the bottom. And you notice that price likely just tapped very, very nicely within the 50% Fibonacci line before it rejected towards the downside. So this very, very clear cuts, very, very obvious, and it's extremely clean. You notice it's very, very close to with the Fibonacci trend line, bearish trend line. So next, another one I, like, I would like to show you. Looking at this specific scenario, very, very obvious swing, very, very obvious swing low. You can draw Fibonacci line from the top to the bottom price actually. We traced back up to the 78.6% Fibonacci line. So it's quite a high retracement price forward very, very nicely before we trace back up and shot towards the downside. Okay, let's move on back to the chart, to the, to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so let's go through this one more time. Fibonacci lines, retracement lines should not cut through. Should not cut through two large areas of the market structure. So in this specific scenario, this actually cut through the trend line. It's not valid anymore. It's not clear. It should be following the market structure very, very cleanly. So when you're drawing a trend line, you should follow the price of movement and not deviate too much. Any questions so far, feel free to let me know in the chat. Okay, let's move on. Okay, as I mentioned just now, through that practice that we had, price is following very, very nicely with the market structure. So you saw, it's following very, very nicely. That's how you should be drawing a Fibonacci retracement trend line. So it works well when it follows price movements and Fibonacci lines actually work better on higher time frame. Why? It's because it's due to less noise. Less noise as in less, less deviation away. So price does not move away too much from the Fibonacci trend line. Okay, next, let's move on. Okay, clear market structure. This is actually very, very clear cut. This is a very, very nice a very, very nice market structure. So although a fit retracement can also be used in chop, in both choppy and trending markets. So it's important to look for clear market structure. So in this case right here, clear swing high, swing low, clear swing high, and a clear swing low. Then clear swing high again, clear swing low, and another clear swing high. So if you want to screenshot this, please screenshot this now before we continue. You can whip out your phone, take photo before we continue. Okay, next. This is a very, very unclear market structure that we do not like at all. Okay, so you see, price does not. Where is it? Price, there's no significant swings at all. Price is very, very choppy and it suddenly moves up. Even the downward, downward, it deviates. Let me clear everything. Even if you try to draw a Fibonacci line from the top of this swing high towards this swing low, it's not, it's, it's totally wrong. It's because price, this area deviates quite far away from the trend line. Same thing if you draw from the bottom to the top, the bottom right here to the top if you actually draw a line across it's not that clear because price went up and it's a very, this area it actually retraced too much so it deviates quite far away what you want is for the trend line and price to be relatively close with it okay let us move on So there are actually 
they are actually fit numbers that we typically use in trading. You can actually take a screenshot now if you want. Please screenshot this down. It's very, very important. Screenshot this down and please apply it. Please try to apply Fibonacci tr uh, trend lines when you are trading. So now that we know how to draw the FIB retracement trend line, let's look at the different types of levels ranging from negative to above 100%. So although the tool used is Fibonacci retracement, it can lead to three types of Fibonacci expansions, those below 0%, which is the Fibonacci expansions right here negative 61.8% and negative 27.2%. You will only be using these two. So retracements, those from 0 to 100%, which is, the regular, which is the regular ones, right here, regular ones, 0 to 100%, and extensions, Fibonacci extensions for those above 100% which is the 127.2% and the 161.8% Fibonacci extension. So we will go through expansion and extensions more in depth in the coming webinars. So in this webinar, we will just briefly introduce the levels. So I'll give you guys one last chance to actually screenshot this down, take a photo before we continue. All right. Okay, let us move on. Okay, here you can see all the different FIP numbers that we mentioned in the previous slide and how it looks drawn out. So take a note of the starting and ending points. So we started drawing from here and ended drawing here. So take note of the starting and ending points of our Fibonacci trend line, the mid-range retracements, negative expansions. So the negative Fibonacci expansions are right here. And the above 100, the positive Fibonacci retracements. So in all of these three Fibonacci scenarios, we are only using one tool at the end of the day, which is the Fibonacci retracement. All right, let's move on. Okay, today we'll just be focusing on the negative Fibonacci expansion. So using the Fibonacci retracement tool, we make use of the negative levels, namely the negative 61.8% and negative 22%. 27.2% Fibonacci levels. So when using the tool lookout for flash zigzag or lightning symbol, so ideally price should retrace at least 50% in point three as shown in the video right here before reversing off. To take a look, draw from starting to ending, retrace at least 50%. Before you notice, price actually rejected off the negative 27.2% Fibonacci line. Okay, take a look. It looks like a zigzag, like a Harry Potter zigzag line. So the explanation, the clearer the movement of the flash zigzag, the better. We ideally need to wait for prices to retrace at least 50% in point three before taking off in the other direction. Okay. So maybe I'll just watch through it one more time. It actually rejected right here. Rejected back down towards the downside. Phoenix Fibonacci expansion. Let me see. So here is an example of expansion and how it plays out. So starting and ending points, take note of it. Starting right here, ending point right there. Price actually retraced back up to the 61.8% level. So we show how to make use of the support in the negatives. So potentially we want to look out for flash zigzag, potentially look for price to retrace back up before. Heading downwards towards the negative 27.2% Fibonacci retracement line. 
we take a look, price actually retraced back down towards the negative 27.2%. Okay. Bounce back up. So took a look. Take a look. Price when it touches very, very nicely within the negative 27.2%. Price usually comes back to the ending points. So yeah, please screenshot this down before we continue. Please screenshot this down. Just showing examples of how it works. Next, let us move on. Take a look. Even at the negative 61.8%, price actually tapping ultimately into that. You are drawing from the starting point to the end point. Price went up, retraced back down, and went back up towards the negative 61.8% retracements before heading back down towards the and points, which is right here. So yeah, you can actually use the negative expansions, negative 61.8% and negative 27.2% as a potential take profit target. So once price steps into that level, you can look to actually close out your trade already. Just in case price reverses back down like in this scenario. So let us continue. Okay, so take note of the shape of the flash. Make sure price reverses to at least 50% before breaking the starting point. So we draw it, we draw it from the starting point towards the end points right there. So price retraces back at least 50%. So from bottom to the top, at least 50%. And then it hits down towards the negative 27.2% Fibonacci expansion level. So you notice price steps into that and immediately bounces right back up. So please screenshot this down also before we continue. This is the example number three. Right, give it a moment. Okay, let us continue. Okay, so next, looking at, okay, in this GIF right here. So take note of the shape outlined by the orange arrow. So price retraces more than 50% of the Fibonacci trend line. So in this case, more than 100% and reverses nicely of the 27.2% Fibonacci expansion. Take a look, price retraces back down. So maybe we can start doing some, you know, some kind of practice session, intense practice session. So let's find an example. Okay, if you notice right here, I'll be drawing a Fibonacci line from this significant swing high towards the significant swing low. Okay, hi there, Samuel Julian. Nice to see you. So we'll be drawing the Fib from the top towards the bottom. So just now, as I mentioned, price retraced back up towards the 78, at least 50%, 78.6. So we can actually start to see price possibly heading towards the expansion level, negative 27.2%. So notice price actually tapped very, very closely, went down, tapped pretty closely towards the negative 27.2% before it retraces back up. So yeah, this one example on the live charts. So maybe we can start to look for more. Okay, let me find another one. Maybe likely, possibly looking at the euro dollar. This is a currency pair that I like to look at a lot. Okay. Let me find it on the one hour. Okay, let me find a clear one instead. Okay, maybe let's take a look at this. I'll test it out. Okay, didn't bounce. Didn't retrace. Not good enough. 
Let me find this. Okay, this is a pretty, pretty nice one. If you take a look, instead of 78.6, let me find 50%. So you notice, I, drawing, I will be drawing a Fibonacci line from D. Bottom of the swing low towards the swing high, and then price went up. Retrace back down towards the 50% Fibonacci line before pushing up relatively close towards the negative 27.2% level before it actually retraced back down. So just take note, that's how you actually use the Fibonacci expansion levels. So let us find another example, another nice example. Okay, let me find it. Okay, finding, trying to find a clean one, at least 50%. All right, so likely this scenario, so let me test it out. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't close. This is not the greatest example because I'll be drawing from the swing high towards the swing low. Price actually retraced back up towards the 50% Fibonacci line before heading relatively close, not close enough towards the negative 27.2% before it just shot right up. So let me find another example. We'll be just doing practice sessions like this. Okay. Okay. This is quite nice. Okay, let me draw. Is it good enough? Okay, it's actually not good enough. Why is this not valid? This is not a nice Fibonacci line because price actually deviated quite far away from this trend line right there. So this is not a good example. So let us move on. Let me find another one, which is nice. All right. Clean one, trying to find a clean one. Likely this could be possible. Okay, this is actually quite nice. So you notice that price swung from this swing high towards this low, and it retraced back up towards the 50% Fibonacci line right there before it shot down towards the I think I think it did hit the negative 27 negative 61.8 percent so it didn't it actually didn't it went towards the negative 22 27.2 percent Fibonacci expansion line before it kind of consolidated before shooting back up so yeah, always just try to look at the negative 27.2 percent as a potential take profit target. Okay, let's find another one. Find another significant swing. So yeah, this is actually quite a nice one. So you notice that we have a pretty much a significant swing right there. So I'll be drawing a Fibonacci line from the bottom to the top. You notice that price actually retraced down to at least the... Let me draw it out at least the 50% Fibonacci line. Price went up relatively nice, went back down, retested. Went back up relatively close towards the negative 27.2% Fibonacci line before it rejected back down. So relatively close, pretty, pretty close, you can start to close out your trade already. So if you're actually aiming for exactly negative 27.2%, you might actually miss your close and not hit take profit. Okay, next. Let's find another example right there. 50% there isn't anything nice. So maybe I'll move on towards the H4 chart so I can view things clearly. All right. Okay, maybe this, maybe this right here. It is not clean enough. If I actually draw a trend line, I was trying to draw, I was looking at this area, wanted to draw a trend line right there. But what happened? It wasn't clear cut enough. It's pretty clear. All of a sudden, it deviates quite far away and it shot right back up. So this area actually caused me to not want to, not want to view this, this Fibonacci trend line as a valid one. Let's find another one to practice. 
Okay. Okay, this is pretty nice. This is quite nice drawing from this significant swing high right there. This okay, this is not significant enough. Let me find another one. This clear cut enough, I think I'm, I might be looking at one. So this is quite a nice swing high. Okay, but but it did not retrace to 50%. Okay, maybe it did. Okay, here is quite nice. So you take a look, take a look at the H4 chart. So from this significant swing high towards this significant swing low, price is moving very, very closely along the trend line, tap right into it, short right back up, retrace towards the 50% Fibonacci line before heading down towards the negative 27.2% Fibonacci expansion line. So what happens after price steps into that? As we have done many, many back tests, price actually consolidated a bit before rejecting back up towards the starting points of this trend line of the end, end points. So if you actually draw a box over, this is where we draw the fib. All right. Any questions so far? Do let me know in the chat since we are here to learn. Anything you guys do not understand, just ask me. I'll try my best to answer you. Okay, let me check if is this is significant enough. Okay, this is actually not bad. So drawing from a significant swing high towards this significant swing low, price is very, very nicely along this trend line, went back up, retested the 50% Fibonacci line before it shot right down towards the negative 27.2 Fibonacci retracement line. So just now, as I mentioned, price usually hits back up to retest the end point, the previous swing low. So I'll just draw a box out, an extended box, maybe an extended box red. Notice that price actually more or less hits back up towards that area. So it taps into the also the negative 61.8% before it rejected and relatively near towards the starting point, the end points of the Fibonacci line, and then just continue heading back. So what do we call an area like this? We can call it an overlap resistance. So I'll just type it out in case you in case you don't know how to spell it or don't know what I'm talking about. It's the overlap resistance. So inside center break. All right. So yeah, if you want, please screenshot this down before we continue. Okay, I'll just screenshot this down and send it to the chat. Copy link to chart image, send it. All right, I've just sent the link to the chat. You guys can actually check it out right there. So it's actually quite clear cut on that. We can actually move on. Okay, next. Let me move back towards the slide that we are going through. Okay, this is not okay. Invalid Fibonacci. What uh when does a fib retracement becomes invalid? So one of the most common scenarios is of this is when price makes a lower low. Assuming you are drawing a Fibonacci retracement from the top to the bottom, like in the picture. Okay, never mind, right in the picture. So if there are bars on the right that breaks your ending point, it becomes invalid. Just like I mentioned, it deviates quite far away, invalid. There are Fibonacci retracements. They are negative 27.2%, negative 61.8%. And we will touch on them as they basically go through your end point, yet they are still valid. So take a look. Price breaks the points. We want to draw from the top towards the bottom but price didn't retrace back up to 50% level, at least 50%, and it continues going down. So this kind of no longer varied already. Always look for at least 50% retracement. Okay, next we are going through combining Fibonacci levels. So it's for confluence to our trade. Okay, give me a moment. Okay, 
the trick is to find multiple Fibonacci retracement levels lining up together so that you can increase the probability of a bunch of Fibonacci retracement levels working versus a single Fibonacci retracement level working. So this is the definition of a Fibonacci confluence. So I'm just showing a very, very quick example. The negative 27.2% Fibonacci expansion is in line with the 161.8% Fibonacci extension in line with the 78.6% Fibonacci projection. So many, many confluence of these levels and then price just bounce right back up. So maybe I can show an example on the live chart. So let's take a look. I'll try to find one which is nice. So maybe why price bounce right off that area? Likely we can try to see something. Okay, there. Negative 61.8. And an expansion. Okay, there isn't a level right there. So I'm trying to find a nice level, a projection level. Okay, we don't have it right there. We don't have it not clear cut enough expansion drawing up okay maybe we might have something right here okay there's nothing right here no confluence levels yet drawing a fib no confluence yet okay let me find one i've got to find an example for you guys so you guys can understand wait okay, maybe this level Maybe this nice level right here. So can draw a Fibonacci line. Okay, this is quite a nice tick. Okay. So we actually have a nice Fibonacci. We can draw a projection from the top to the bottom and then towards the top again. Likely we might be able to find some kind of some kind of confluence right there. Okay, that isn't this is very, very weird. Let me move on towards the one hour. Try to find one that is significant enough for that bounce. Projection levels. Okay, this could be it. Try from the bottom, top, up. So we have the 100%. I'm actually looking at this area right here, checking whether there was any Fibonacci confluence that caused price to retrace back down. Drawing a flip towards the bottom. Okay, there isn't any. Okay, that's weird. Let me just give you give me a moment. I'm still finding. Finding, find okay, this not the one. Projection top, bottom, and back up. 78.6%. Draw a fit. Okay, this is actually quite nice. Quite a nice retracement area. I'll draw the one three eight. So you actually notice that price actually. Wait, give me a moment. Let me clear this out. And you stick everything clearly in place. Just to show you guys how it works. So Fibonacci line, then we also have another line or fits. Okay, this is not the confluence. If you actually draw. Notice that price actually tapped very, very nicely in the 127.2% Fibonacci, Fibonacci extension level. So I'll just extend it, extended box green. So with that two confluence in place, 127.2% Fibonacci extension. Extension is the positive side. Expansion is the negative side. So we also have the 78.6% Fibonacci projection. So that's how we use it. You can possibly look for a buy entry right there for price to tap and rebound towards the upside. All right. Let us take a look next. Let's find another confluence. Okay. Okay, let me find. Okay. 
potentially this might be it. Let me find. All FIPS. Okay, negative 61.8%. Showing a Fibonacci expansion, top to bottom. Okay, this is actually quite nice. If you actually take a look, the negative the seventy eight point six percent projection and the one six one point eight percent Fibonacci projection. Take a look. So I draw I draw a projection from here. Bam, bam, bam. That's how I draw a projection. Getting the seventy eight point six percent Fibonacci projection. We also draw a Fibonacci line from the top to the bottom. We have the. So over here is the seventy eight point six percent Fibonacci projection. We also have the 161.8% Fibonacci extension. So these two right there actually added confluence to why price actually rejected back down. So price tapped into that level and rejected strongly towards the downside. So I'll just draw that level out. It's quite clear cut right there. Went up, tap, rejected back down. Where does it re where does it reverse towards? It actually reverses towards the more or less the starting points of this Fibonacci high, the previous high right there. So you can call it a support and overlap support if you want. Extend the box green. So this could be a nice sell entry that you could have caught right there. So I'll just copy link to the chart image. I'll just screenshot and just send it to you guys. I just sent the link to the chat already. So any more questions, let me know. Any more questions that you do not understand on Fibonacci confluence, let me know. So let us continue and end this slide. So this another example, negative 27.2% expansion. Just showing examples. I don't expect you guys to, you know, at the end of this session to be able to immediately implement it. You might want to go through some practice drawing on your trading view chart before you start to look for potential buy entries, reversal entries. Okay, let me find what else is needed. All right, for this example, price broke through the negative 127.2% and the a negative 27.2%. And then price went towards the negative 60 negative 61.8% Fibonacci expansion and towards the 161.8% Fibonacci extension. Price then tapped and reversed back down. So that area actually gives us a pretty strong confluence area that price can possibly reverse. Okay, same thing. Drawing down negative 27.2%, 127.2%, and even a 100% Fibonacci projection. So this entire area right here actually added confluence that price could potentially reverse and point back up. So price then proceeded to bounce off this very, very strong level. There's many, many confluence. Okay, hi there, Steffi Tapin. Okay. Let me go through this. So stop loss. Stop loss beyond. What does it mean? It means that you should always put your stop loss beyond a key Fibonacci confluence area. So the reason for this is because more often than not, price is attracted to such strong areas of Fibonacci confluence. And if your stop loss is right before instead of beyond the area, Fibonacci confluence area you can potentially hit your stop loss, get stopped right up when the market starts to reverse. And then traders start to complain about getting stop hunted, saying the brokers manipulated the market. It's actually not. It's actually there was confluence. There was a confluence caused price to tap in before reversing back up. So take profit before. What does it mean? It means that you should always put your take profit target before a key Fibonacci confluence area. The reason for this is because when price reaches the Fibonacci confluence area, the, re the reason for this is because when price reaches the Fibonacci confluence area, there's a high chance that it 
will not be able to go beyond it and instead of reaching your profit target, it reverses back to your entry. So always put your take profit target just before the Fibonacci confluence area. Just slightly before one or two pips before would be nice. So this is one of the reasons why people complain that the market is manipulated because they miss their take profit target by one pip. So yeah, you can actually screenshot this down before we continue. All right. So once you guys have screenshotted it down, take a photo down, let's move on. So we have come to the end of this webinar. So yeah, really thank you guys for joining. If you guys have any more questions, let me know. I'll give you guys one more minute. One more minute to ask me any more questions before I end this webinar. So until my time, 6.53, I'll be waiting for your questions. So meanwhile, while waiting for your questions, I would like to say that tonight, okay, for my time, it's tonight. It will be when I'm sleeping. It will be 2 a.m. for me when the FOMC news actually happens. So yeah, just take care trading. Please try not to enter any scalps just before the FOMC news. You can potentially get stopped out. And, and also Friday, we have the NFP. The entire week is really, really, very volatile. Hey, no problem, Juha. Hey, see you next time. See you next time. See you guys next time. Appreciate you guys for joining. All right. So let me just send that link one last time. Link three. That's the link you guys can actually find me, can actually contact me there if you want after the webinar. So yeah, thank you, Joha. Thank you, Peter, Benny Brook. Thank you, Samuel, Julian for joining. Hope to see you guys next time and really take care. Stay safe trading. Hey, goodbye, guys. I'll be ending the stream now.